Welcome to the uh, June 6th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Uh, we have uh, come out of executive session. We actually already convened the meeting and called the roll. All council members are here and uh, Chief Hale just arrived. Um, announcements. Um, I have a few. Uh, so first of all, I do want to announce our work session that's going to be on June 8th about the municipal fiber and we're going to be in rooms A and B. And to that extent, um, oh, and that does start at 7, uh, we will not be broadcasting live. So you can see uh, the work session on Saturday, June 10th and June 11th, 6 a.m. noon and 6 p.m. Um, also, uh, I wanted to mention uh, that the 9-11 stair climb fundraiser is going to be at the Yellow Springs Brewery this Thursday at 7. So I'd urge everybody to support that great event. And um, also, we'll have another meeting, but I did want to mention that the YS Pride weekend is going to be uh, June 25th, 26th. Plenty of events going on there uh, around town. And then, Marianne, did you want to say something about Catherine? That was on my list. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Catherine Hitchcock had been on uh, HRC for two years and uh, resigned at our last meeting. And um, one of the things that we want to start doing is m more acknowledge, more public acknowledgement of uh, commission members. So Catherine was very active on HRC and helped start uh, NAMI, National Association for People with Mental Illness, Families mm -hmm. for, for People with Mental Illness. So we're sad to see her go, and we just wanted to acknowledge her service to the village. Okay. Thanks. Nice photo. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. I love nice. that photo. And it's on our Facebook page. Wow. <laughs> and I guess you've got an announcement. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so I guess there's a little event coming up this weekend um, <laughs> called Street Fair. Um, uh, everything's everything's you know nothing nothing as much has changed I would like to reiterate the street closures and timing um, 68 is closed between limestone and uh, Dayton Street Dayton Street is closed between 68 and Walnut uh, Walnut is closed between limestone and Dayton except for people getting access to Tom's but that's only via Elm Street uh, short streets closed but Glen Street is open. The thing that we're, we're doing this year because of, of uh, parking and to allow for the buses to get through more easily is we're restricting parking on the west side of Walnut Street from, um, from Fairfield down to, to, um, down to Dayton Street. Um, it gets very difficult for the buses to get through there. And we're also restricting parking on Walnut from Elm to Dayton Street. So um, trying to make, keep it safer. We're trying to keep that section of Walnut Street closed so that it's safer for, for pedestrians. Um, the beer, the, we will have music down at the, uh, at, uh, by the funeral home from 9 until 5, and we'll have music here at the Bryan Center from noon until 7. So there's lots to enjoy. It's not just about shopping. There's lots of fun, lots, and st lots of stuff to enjoy. So please come. Anybody else have an announcement? OK. Um, consent <coughs> agenda has the minutes of May 16th regular meeting. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. I abstain. Okay. Um, Brian, um, petitions and communications? Yeah, we had a few things. So we had the uh, mayor's monthly report, business as usual. Um, <laughs> Rachel McKinley, our treasurer, uh, reported on activity in our account, which is minimal. But I did think it's worth noting that uh, she made a note about potentially uh, investing some of our funds uh, in, in a way that we will get more return and that is something that we'll get information on and be able to evaluate. So no information yet, but that will be looked at. It was something the council uh, asked to be done. And then we had a nice thank you from uh, Dan West, uh, one of the, well, the gym teacher at Mills Lawn, thanking Officer Meister for participating in the third and fourth grade bike hikes, which were very successful. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to public hearings and oh, review of the agenda. Um, 
Is there anything we need to add to the agenda or change? Okay. Um, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Um, Judy, if you could read that in by title only. Yeah, this is Ordinance 2016-10, repealing Section 414.02 of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 414.02. Regarding the placement of a stop sign on Livermore at South College Street. I'm sorry, yes. That's Thank right. Because <laughs> without that, it doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Patty, quickly, can you uh, Yes, this? we had we had, had some citizens express concerns about um, the traffic on Livermore Street potentially being dangerous to pedestrians who were trying to cross mid-block uh, where there was no stop sign in order to get either over to the college or over to the wellness center. Um, there is a stop sign at North College, uh, Livermore on Livermore at North College, and this simply moves it from removes it from North College and puts it down at South College where it would be more effective uh, to get the uh, folks safely across the road. Uh, that's where the majority of the foot traffic is, is down there in the area of the Wellness Center. And then we'll put a crosswalk in there as well to make it uh, more visible and get folks safely across the road. Okay, any other comments or questions? The only thing that I would ask is that you, is that our staff work closely with um, the, the college to you know make that as as to keep as much parking as possible right because yes. that is a very popular spot um, but to make it safe but to maintain as much parking and it looks like there may be a possibility of, of perhaps um, doing adding some asphalted there may be a need to add some asphalt to right. J um, Jason's going to work with Reggie. Uh, Reggie Stratton is in support of this moving this stop sign as well. He agrees that it's it's needed. And uh, Jason is going to be working with Reggie on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a second reading, so I will open the public hearing for public comment. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintra? Yes. Uh, now the first reading of Ordinance 2016-11. <clears throat> this is repealing Chapter 1266 signs of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting a new Chapter 1266 signs. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, you're here. Okay. <laughs> you're ready yeah. to present. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Could you tell everybody who you are? Yeah, Denise Swinger, Zoning Administrator. Thank you. Um, it was suggested that staff um, ask Planning Commission to look at the sign ordinance in more detail because of the enormity of the zoning code. It was an update in 2013. Um, there wasn't a lot of time left to really delve into it. So um, the, over the last three months at the March, April, and May meetings, um, that is exactly what Planning Commission has done. And as a result of these meetings, there were a number of changes that were made. Uh, first off, the order of the sections was changed so um, uh, combining application procedures and fees so there's only nine sections instead of ten. Uh, we also, um, they also put permitted signs at the very front. Um, then they also in the discussion uh, decided to allow ground signs as a permitted use in the Central Business District, B1. Um, in section 126604E uh, prohibited signs. Um, they put a little more clarification on pole signs, which are not allowed as higher than six feet. And I'll come back to that a little bit later when we get into the next uh, ordinance as to why. Um, in section 126605, signs not requiring permits, they added um, two sentences under the political signs. Um, signs dealing with candidates or issues appearing on a ballot in election that's sanctioned by the Board of Elections, as well as signs may be placed 30 days prior to an election and must be removed by 10 days after an election. That seems to come up every time there's an election. The office, the village manager's office is called and people are asking, when can I put it up? Uh, when do I take it down? And then it requires staff to go contact Board of Elections and they don't really know. Um, they don't really have any rules on that. So. Um, Judy was kind enough to ask other municipal clerks around Ohio to look for a little more research, and that seems to be the norm. It's about 30 days before and up to 10 days after. 
Um, I, also, what and we've been told is that it, is that it's it's against freedom of speech. You can't restrict political signs. We're not restricting it. We're just giving a time frame for it for when you can have them up. But that that's restriction. Well, uh, I mean, so I. I mean, I'll leave it up to legal because they there were other okay. things they said you have to restrict, but this was not this was allowed. Okay. Um, what we can't restrict is the number of signs they want to put into a yard. Right. Like if somebody wants to put one person sign ten times across their property, which you sometimes see on larger acres of land, we can't restrict that. Okay. But as far as the time frame. Mm -hmm. We were told it was okay. Okay. Um, but, okay. Go ahead. Nope, nope. Uh, we'll have a second reading too, so we'll be able to maybe get some more answers on that. Um, allowing internally lit signs in business too. I mean, they're there, they've been there. I don't know if that was an oversight in the zoning code. Um, so we made sure that they were in there now. And also, as a part of that, in 126602C3, we changed the word neon to internally illuminated, mainly because of the change in technology. You now have LED lighting. It's not all gas um, illumination. So, and then um, skipping that one for the next uh, ordinance. So that you're done with the signs? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, this is. <laughs> Three months. I'm trying to condense it here. Uh, in section 126603, permitted signs, the word permitted was added before signs and before total signs in the first paragraph, um, and also um, change permitted to allowed. And this is just to clarify what is um, what is permitted, and um, because if you count the number of signs that are allowed, and you and you say uh, two signs, two types of signs, and three signs total. And you don't put permitted in there, then and then a handicap uh, type of sign, a uh, buckle up your seatbelt safety sign as you're leaving a parking lot. Those all would count as a sign, and then you wouldn't be able to have enough enough leniency to have that. So those kinds of signs are under uh, what we call signs not requiring a permit, and so we're, that's why we wanted to clarify this has to do with permitted signs. And so in that same section, we increased the types of signs from two to three and the total number of signs from three to four. And this is only in the business and the industrial districts. We also um, cross-referenced in 1266.06 non-conforming signs and in 1266.09 obsolete signs because there was a little bit of confusing, confusion regarding the regulations for signs that have been grandfathered into the new zoning code so people can see both. Also in table 126.03, we added to ground sign the word freestanding because they both are very similar and they have the same requirements, but there's a little bit of a definition change and yet there wasn't freestanding in the original uh, permitted list in the table. So we just added that to ground and then with Melissa's help, she um, helped us uh, make the chart so it's much easier to read. The way the zoning code is now, you don't you have to go back and forth between the pages to see okay what was what was C, what was A, and now she has this uh, columns across the top identifying not only by name but but by the the actual letter that they represented. And that's it for 1266 signs. Okay. Can, uh, can I go back to incidental signs? Mm -hmm. where, where, where is that? Where am I? It's in uh, 126605 on the second page of that section. Yeah, it's uh, just signs above. Signs don't require a permit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because. Uh, I guess when I read this, so you know, I, I understand the description. So does that mean if I want to hang my chamber sign, my no smoking sign, and my restroom sign all in my window, that that's not permitted? 
no, these are this this is permitted. So right, but it says permits. it says it's a total of two signs. But see, that's why we put permitted, uh, because we we don't require a permit for that, for a right. for a sign not requiring permits. But what I'm saying is, if I want to have a third sign, it says two in here. Is why he's saying. It says a total of two signs per business indicating acceptance of credit cards location. Oh, as to what the requirements are for that itself. Yes, that's what you're only allowed to do. Okay. And the yeah. reasoning for that? that? That was just what they allowed before, and we, we didn't have a problem with that. Okay. Oh, there's already, I mean, people are no, I know. already going far beyond that. <laughs> I mean, each one of, you know, there's, a lot of them have Chamber of Commerce member stickers in their windows, and um, they have the credit cards, they have rest. I mean, that's most of them are way over this already. Um, and I mean, that's, if you, yeah, I mean, like device signs, like is allowed one on a gas pump per gas pump or container. Um, which one ex exactly was that one? The incidental, incidental. signs. The incidental. I mean, it's, they're not, I don't even consider them signs. They're decals. Yeah. They're, they're almost all window decals. Right. Maybe that's how it can be differentiated. Um, and, and it could be just not to have a total in there. I mean, it's yeah. up to you. I mean, okay. ultimately, that could be an amendment. I mean, I guess that's why I wondered what the rationale was. I mean, is it because, you know, it's cluttered, but, I mean, if a shop owner wants their window to be cluttered I don't know yeah I don't they did not they did not unless Jerry has something different they did not no, they did not mention that, mention that hmm. at all. so that could potentially be a revision for the second reading because you're am I hearing that yeah I mean it's it's just to eliminate that well you know what it says is it says and are attached to a permitted sign Exterior or wall. Oh yeah. Windows. Okay. But I mean, Denise has planning on Monday. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just it well, doesn't seem like it's a necessary limitation to me. But right. maybe, maybe there's something I'm not thinking of. I mean, and we we all know that a lot of businesses basically use their windows as placards. I mean, there's you know there are event signs all over their windows, and this would certainly. I, I don't know if we want to legislate that. I certainly don't. And this would certainly start to pull that into, into question. Um, I mean, I think that rather than going back to planning, because, um, you know, you have to notice these things in the paper, and uh, there's no time for this meeting coming up. Uh, if, you, if, it, if at council level you just want to just take out, mm -hmm. just so that it says that not exceeding, ex not exceeding a total of two square feet um, well, indicating I, acceptance of credit cards, location of restrooms, blah, blah, blah. And just take out a total of two signs per business. You could. Mm -hmm. but, but we're keeping, you're suggesting we keep in two square feet? My concern would be then that people are going to exceed the two square feet as yeah. well. Right. It's, I mean, people already literally, I mean, the, the Emporium is one that, that right. all of their windows mm -hmm. and their doors <laughs> <laughs> right. It's essentially covered. That's why this was flagged. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I would propose we take out the two square feet, too. I second it. And what will it say? No, Just incidental, incidental signs, signs indicating. Indicating acceptance of credit cards, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Should we vote on the amendment? 66. We can just do a voice vote on that, can't we? Yes. So I need, I need your amendment to the ordinance. Uh, the, the incidental signs, signs uh, section 1266.05, incidental signs would read, incidental signs indicating acceptance of credit cards, the location of restroom, restrictions on smoking. It just takes out mm -hmm. not exceeding a total of oh. two square feet, a total of two signs per business. Oh. So, so it's removing, just the definition. Right. I'm, so, I'm sorry for now. Right, of what an incidental sign is. Yeah, okay. I'm wondering if we want just to yeah. just to cover it. I'm wondering if we want to add the word okay. something about events or something about um, just to cover all of those signs that people yeah. have in their windows. Um, 
because these those are different than these. I mean, these are typically very small decals mm -hmm. that are, you know, some people put down in the center uh, or in the okay, corner. Um, I don't know, what does anybody think? Fine. Just leave it like this and not worry about it. And just those are just all handbills that yeah, people yeah. take up, put up and take down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there is That's a temporary, temporary window temporary. sign. Yeah, okay. In there as well. It's kind of okay. split up between the. Okay, so yeah. uh, can I get a motion to oh. accept the new language um, for incidental signs? So we'll second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anything else? Yeah, well, I just I have a question. It's not about a change that was made, but it's in the general provisions, and it is number six under general provisions. And it says a sign attached to a building shall not be placed in any location that would cause significant architectural features of the building to be covered, hidden, or obscured. So I'm wondering who determines whether an <laughs> whether a sign is covering a significant architectural feature. Uh, How would that be done? People that, be that apply for a sign permit have to actually show a mock-up of the sign right. itself, as well as where it's going to be on the building. Right. So but it's then a, who it, determines? It would be up to the zoning office to you. Mm -hmm. And if there's a dispute, it could go to the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. I mean, at least it yeah. has people thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? I'll just mention it because it seemed to be um, important to add regulations in front of official, and one spot was missed, which is section four. Uh, let's see, so it's 1266.09, section four. So I guess just to be consistent, I mean, not, not a big deal, but. Uh, building regulation. Yeah, because it's it's added everywhere else, yeah. just not there. Okay. Okay, are we ready to take a vote? Yes. Uh, any, I'll just any comments from citizens before we take a vote? Is is it just a first reading? So we will have another uh, public hearing. Okay, seeing and hearing none. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yeah, Hempling. Yes. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Wintro. Yes. Uh, Twenty sixteen dash twelve. Judy. Yeah, this is repealing section twelve eighty four point oh eight definitions. RS of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section twelve eighty four point oh eight definitions. RS. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Denise? Yeah. In, uh, in the definitions RS, we decided to remove all of the prohibited signs definitions and signs not requiring permits and just uh, folding them into the sections within 1266, leaving only what's in the definitions in the back permitted signs. With that being said, um, we we had us we in doing this we were clarifying um, the difference between a ground sign a freestanding sign and realized that they were both a definition in the uh, as a permitted uh, definition um, but they weren't showing up in the table so in that table we added ground slash freestanding but then further in that the freestanding had one or more poles or brackets uh, in, in 1266. Um, and we had debated because pole signs are not allowed, um, that, they, that there should be more of a uh, distinction. And so we, the Planning Commission decided to make it two or more brackets. But then when <laughs> they came back around at a later meeting about pole signs, they decided to make the definition of pole signs any sign that's on a pole that's over six feet so that a person in fact could put 
a sign on one pole as long as they follow the freestanding guidelines. <laughs> that makes sense. I know it's hard to follow. But that being said, one of the things the Planning Commission didn't catch at the end of that, and I didn't catch, was that we had, we, they made an amendment in 1280 and, well, it was actually in 1266 that, that refers to 1284, and that was um, the you definition, the, 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 R, the under freestanding. Yep. Executive number seven, signed freestanding. Um, so initially, we, the, the first exhibit A you had uh, says uh, attached to a building or wall which is supported by two or more poles or braces. The revised exhibit A that you have in front of you to accompany this ordinance is actually back to the original language um, attached That's to a building or wall which is supported by one or more poles or braces. Just uh, not making an amendment, just leaving it as it originally stood. The, and the, so the only change to that section is that in parentheses following that it says C ground sign, so that there's cross-referencing. Cross That's the only change there. That will allow someone to do a single pole, but they'll just follow the freestanding guidelines. <laughs> so. Is anybody going to be able to understand this without coming in and talking to you first? <laughs> It actually is making it easier, uh, I think. Yeah, the attorney's smiling. <laughs> Probably not, but I, but um, I mean, I I understand it. So, <laughs> any questions about any of this? Comments, citizens? Any comments or questions? Uh, Judy, would you please? Well, we need to amend that, or we, we need to. No, because we're, we're fine. We're fine. Good. Correct. Okay. Exhibit A. Perfect. In front of you. Yep. Great. Okay. So McQueen. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Thank you. I would like to thank Denise and the Planning yeah, Commission thank for you. their wow. hard work. Wow. I mean, that is a lot of work. And there, there, there is more to come, I believe, on some <laughs> other sections of the code. Right? More typos <laughs> and things like that. Thank okay. okay. Um, next on the agenda, the last piece of legislation is Resolution 2016 31. Title only, please. Yes, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into a uniform network accounting agreement with the Auditor of State. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Melissa, is this yours mm -hmm. to describe? So this is going to kill two birds with one stone with my um, assistant village manager's report as well. So basically um, what this is is we, we currently have one vendor for our finance, payroll, and our utility billing. And um, we've, we've had a number of issues over the last few years with the current vendor, and um, it's, it's kind of made me look outside of the current vendor to see if maybe there is a better product out there to, to meet our needs. And the, the first piece of this is going to be the accounting and uh, payroll piece of it. Um, so this is for the village to utilize the Auditor of States software, which is called UAN, or Uniform Accounting Network. So they developed a software program that um, allows municipalities to um, use the software that is in compliance with the Auditor of State. So um, it's, it's significantly cheaper than what we were paying um, our current provider. And it also includes um, computers and printers for, it would be for myself and for uh, the uh, accounts payable and payroll technician as well. And it's, it's a significant cost savings. Um, we currently pay our current provider about $20,000 a year for all three modules for the utility billing, the finance and the uh, payroll. And for the finance and payroll, um, I think it's going to be about $4,000. And then it's 50 bucks a month would be the uh, hardware and software support which would include uh, the computers and the printers every two years. Um, but it's, it's going to save a lot of time as well. Um, I'm currently doing all of the financial statements manually. It takes me about two weeks to prepare those. And there's room for human error because I'm doing this in Excel and I'm you know transferring information from one program to another. And with this, you can basically, it, it automatically generates our financial statements, so it removes um, any kind of human error from the equation and uploads it straight to the Auditor of State within minutes. So I think that it's going to be good for a number of reasons. Um, financially, it's smarter, and it also cuts down on any room for human error because this program was developed by the Auditor, so it's in the exact same format that they need things to be. Wow. Well, it sounds like another cost savings is your time, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I, I, I'm familiar with the UAN software. I've used it before. It, it's an excellent program, and the support that you get from from the UAN network people, it's amazing. So I think Melissa will be very happy with it. Any other questions or comments? Citizens? Um, so we'll take a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you come up to the podium, state your name, and uh, you have three minutes to make your comments. Okay, if we, I see none. Um, we have no special reports. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Elisa Meyer. And I wanted to report uh, an incident that happened at the uh, behind the gulch last weekend. Um, I witnessed officers um, getting a woman out of her car, a woman that I know that had uh, approached us earlier, let us know that she had been drinking but had no intention of driving home. She did everything that we ask drunk people to do. She went to wait it out. She called for a ride from her daughter to come and get her and then she reclined her seat in her car and put her keys away off to the side and waited for her daughter to come and get her. Exactly what we ask people to do when they're intoxicated. A few minutes later, the police broke in her window, shattered in her window and dragged her out of her car, arrested her and processed her through county. And I want to know if this is the policing, the community policing that we talk about that we have in this village because I don't see it. Uh, there were so many uh, different ways that this could have been handled, and I just wanted to report this. This is not the only time I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen repeatedly. Uh, another friend of mine recently, or I shouldn't say too recently, but several months ago was walking to meet his designated driver in an alleyway, and the police stopped him and questioned him and then arrested him for public intoxication. So I ask you, if we're not supposed to walk out of the bar at all, having been drinking, then, then what is it there for? How are we supposed to get home? If you don't want us to walk home, if you don't want us to drive home, I mean, but this is why people get into their cars, and this is why they take the chance of drunk driving to begin with. They're trying to not get caught. They're afraid to lay down in their car and take a rest or sleep it off. They're afraid to wait until somebody comes and gets them. They're afraid to just sit by the side of the bar and wait for their designated driver, or heaven forbid, walk a block to go meet their designated driver. I just wanted to voice my opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I do believe that those kinds of issues are things that will be taken up by the um, by the task force that's being formed. And, and actually, um, uh, I've talked to the woman involved, and she came to HRC, and we're, Judith and I are going to be talking about it as well. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that I was I I just came back from a short trip. I've heard from uh, three citizens about this incident. There's a lot of concern in the community about what occurred. And um, so I do think that uh, it, it, it bears looking into and making, you know, uh, I think it's of grave concern to m me that this sort of thing would occur. It needs to be investigated and understood what exactly happened and um, how to prevent it from happening in the future. <clears throat> And I'm Chrissy Cruz, and I met with Chief Hale today about not only that incident, but also another incident that really causes me a lot of concern. Um, a resident in our community was walking out of Keys Alley, and a police officer, the same officer in the incident with Talitha, um, he, the officer said that he thought the person looked agitated. And as he walked by his car, he thought that the person had his fist clenched and looked agitated. So what the officer did was he followed him down the street to the Mills Park Hotel and pulled in in the parking lot there and immediately asked this person for his identification, um, what was wrong with him, and when the person was a little bit belligerent, threw him to the ground, and he ended up arresting him, and he's still in jail. And my question for Chief Hale today when we talked was, are you saying that we're not allowed to walk down the street anymore looking agitated because my puppy pisses on the floor quite often and I might be walking around looking agitated and does this mean that I have to be 
worried about being stopped by the police. So this other incident in the Gulch, and I'm hearing of more incidents, people are calling me and talking about these things. These are things that are making us feel unsafe in our community. Unsafe because of the actions of the people who are supposed to be keeping us safe. And I don't think there's really any excuse for it. He, maybe he did look agitated. He's allowed to walk down the street looking agitated. He told the officer several times, I, I listened to the dash cam video, he told the officer several times, why are you doing this to me? I didn't do anything. And I also heard him several times saying, the, the officer said, get on the ground. And, and, and he was saying, I'm on the ground. What more do you want from me? It sounded like something that you hear on a video from major city police reports. But I have a lot of concerns, just personally as a citizen. Um, I will try not to look agitated when I'm walking around downtown. Thanks, Chrissy. Any other comments? No, excuse me, somebody else has. Bob. Oh. Everybody knows me. Oh, state your name anyway. I was a Navy anyway. in 1960. I've been here 56 years. I've seen police chiefs come and go. I've seen patrolmen come and go. Uh, I know we live in a very unique liberal community, full of open, optimistic, trusting people. But sometimes I think we get a little too smug on how good we are, how understanding we are, and I don't think we really pursue some of the things that occur at the lower levels of our society. Uh, being a policeman is a one tough job. I would not want to be one. They have to maintain a level of control consistent with the situation, and I think that's one of the problems I've seen. Now, I'm going to need more in a minute. I just want to recount something I saw 25 years ago. Street fair. Russell. Uh, Shaw. I can't remember his name. Shaw. But anyway, his parents were teachers at Mills Lawn. He has a bluegrass band, and for years he has parked in the by the mine deposit bank drive through And two local policemen came and said, you can't park here for the street fair. And Russell is a very active guy. He says, come on. He says, I've always parked here. You can't say I don't park here. OK, that was enough of a challenge of police authority, which sometimes gets sort of out of whack, because police authority is important for police safety as much as anything else. But anyway. It got out of whack. They grabbed him. They threw him down the ground, tried to push his face on the curb. Russ said, Bob, I got to roll. I got in the ground, but I got cuffed, taken to jail for disorderly conduct and failure to obey a lawful order. Well, to me, it was an example of excessive force for the situation. You've got to have effective force all the time. But it's got to be tempered to the situation. Now, I've never really known one policeman in my 56 years since I've been back in my hometown where I was born of any policeman that didn't really want to do a good job and be respected for doing a good job. So unless we are hiring the wrong people, it has to come down to a issue of training. It absolutely has to be that issue. But, you know, and, uh, I know Talitha, and my daughter knows Talitha, and Talitha, when she has a little alcohol, could let words flow, but to put this woman through what she did, uh, it was an overzealous situation. And if we don't learn from it, then we are disrespecting a lot of people, including the police, because they want to do the best job they can. And the bad thing is, the upsetting thing is, for every thousand situations where the police were called, maybe 995 are resolved that you never even hear about. Well, this one you're going to hear about because it was out of bounds. It was absolutely out of bounds. I expect everybody to really find out what happened. Can more training be helpful? Uh, uh, but it's a problem, and I think sometimes we have to recognize that even educated, open, optimistic people 
have problems and they, they have to solve them. So I say solve them. But I know the police want to do a good job. Give them every chance in training and help to do it. The last thing is, in this situation, they weren't in the cruiser, so they didn't know. When you're in a cruiser and stop somebody, you know more about that person than anybody else. You know where they live, who they are, outstanding arrest record, anything. They had no chance to know Talitha Green was in that van. And uh, big city policing, if you're in the van, uh, it is don't be in the driver's seat. Be in the passenger seat. Have the keys out of sight because people have been known to start it up, run over an officer, do all sorts of things. So in this case, you know, it was not a real easy situation, but it was an overreaction that has to be dealt with. It has to be acknowledged that it does happen. Not everybody is equal, but it's a small town. We've got to, we've got to do better. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I, I definitely think that, that the training is an issue. It's something that, that uh, Brian and I actually talked with Patty about today. Um, yeah, I don't know that it's, that it's by the book training because I think that officers are being, being trained very much by the book to, to certain situations that may not fit in Yellow Springs. And I think that, that um, uh, we do really need to communicate to our officers what our expectations and I think perhaps we haven't but I also think that there that there is a situation where citizens do have to take some responsibility and and you know have some um, uh, understanding as Bob said that these folks really do the officers do want to do a good job I do not believe we have officers that are going out looking to <coughs> unnecessarily arrest people I think that it's it's a situation of escalation and potentially not being able to just not being able to deal with the escalation and so um, I would like I would like us to go and you know have some kind of additional training we've talked to Patty about it um, I don't know that I want to wait everything to wait for the task force situation so um, yeah and I just want to reiterate we are taking it very seriously and I agree about the training and you know before this meeting uh, I heard that Patty and the chief had talked and that that is something we're gonna do in terms of de-escalation I agree with Karen this is not something we're gonna wait on for the task force so um, so I appreciate the comments and I just want everybody to know that we are all taking it really seriously Did do you want to take one? Can you take one minute? Yes. Okay. When you say that you don't think that they're going around and looking to start problems, I was only going to start uh, going to talk about the Talitha incident. But you know, I have a couple of dear friends that I uh, encourage to move here. They own a fabulous Mexican restaurant, best I've ever had here. I encourage them to move here. What an open, what a loving society. They're Mexican. They have been stopped three times and put up against the wall, mm -hmm. just being checked walking to their car to get me some tres leches cake. This is unnecessary. Mm. When you say they're not looking for problems, these people do not look vicious. They definitely don't. I have a friend, Jason. He's got two girls here in the schools here. He's a coach downstairs for Pete's sakes. He has been stopped numerous times. He's black. He's a prison guard for Pete's sakes. He's a coach downstairs, and yet when he brings his daughter to another team member's uh, birthday party they're having, he needs to get stopped into question as to what he's doing at the John Bryan Center as, as if he doesn't have a right somehow to be here when you say that they're and not I going to looking for trouble I've been pulled out of a car a couple of years ago from stopping to talk to a friend there was three officers involved on that one and one asked the other two not to do it we're we're not here to talk about individual incidents what you heard from us is that we don't find it acceptable that chief Patty has talked to chief council members have made it clear to Patty that we don't find it acceptable that five council members sitting here are not happy it's going to be we're going to pursue it well, we're going to resolve I don't time. I don't want to talk about individual incidents just trust that we have we are making it clear to our staff that we want things to change you've made it clear before on other instances and not to this extent okay okay thank you well I, I would just like to say that um, 
I'm not exactly sure, but um, I do believe that council um, is beginning to take a more active role in uh, both saying what we expect of the police officers and then figuring out how to have that happen. And um, this is, I think, sort of a new um, endeavor for council. I think in the past, council have not gotten involved in that way. And so there is some work to figure out how to do this because there is a structure. We have to uh, uh, obey the structure. But I concur with Karen that, I mean, we want our officers to know how to de-escalate, not to escalate situations. And when it starts sounding <coughs> like the things you hear on the news, that is very troubled. I'm very troubled by that. Just to say, too, um, you may already know this, but uh, the council decided this year as one of our goals to, to um, create a justice system task force, and we're just in process of uh, interviewing uh, interested citizens who want to participate in that. And, you know, part of that, the job of that committee uh, or task force is going to be to really help uh, the whole community, the police, uh, the mayor's court and the citizens that we all, you know, figure out ways to do things better and get on the and be on the same page about how we're how you know our community is being, you know, policed. So and uh, chief's been very kind to, uh, you know, trust that we're going to do this in a way that's not demonizing the police, the police department and the police who are doing a difficult job. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to support the work that they do in a way that, you know, we can all be really proud of their work and feel, you know, that it really does give a sense of greater trust in, or greater safety in the community. Um, so, but we're, we're, we are in process of setting that committee, so. And those will be public meetings and uh, so citizens can come and participate and be a part of that discourse that takes place there. Thanks, Judith. Um, any other citizens' concerns? The, the general carpenter uh, guitar player is Russell Shaw. And <laughs> parents, uh, Clark Nuzzle. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Make sure that gets in the minutes, <laughs> Judith. Got it. Um, next item, we have no special reports and we have no old business. The next item on the agenda is new business uh, discussion regarding uh, Morris Bean sewer tap. I know that there are three gentlemen here from Morris Bean. Patty, do you want to introduce the topic? Uh, yes. Um, this has been an ongoing topic of discussion for, for several years now. And uh, in the audience tonight, we have Bill Magro of Morris Bean. Larry Kleinheinz, Kleinschnitz. Kleinschnitz. I knew I would get that wrong, Larry. And Steve McCready, who is their uh, legal counsel. Um, Steve, do you want to come up and talk about the potential agreement to allow Morris Bean to tap their sewer? Good evening. Hi. Uh, I like the fact that I was already identified as the attorney before I introduced <laughs> I said legal counsel. <laughs> I, was I called in the attorney. No, no, oh, I, I called in the attorney. The counsel. Um, uh, my name is Steve McCready. I'm with the Springfield Law Firm of Mark Brown, Helen Harper. I've been practicing there for 33 years. The firm has represented Morris Bean longer than I've been practicing law. Before that, I grew up in Fairborn, um, went to um, Park Hills High School and spent a lot of my misspent youth in Yellow Springs and had nothing but fond memories of the time there. The issue before council stems from a sequence of events relating to the long-standing position of the village to permit Morse Bean to connect to the village's sanitary sewer system. There have been many years of discussions, formal village resolutions, ordinances, a written contract between the village and Morse Bean providing for the connection on certain specified terms and conditions. Specific measures have been taken by the village and Morris Bean during the past 10 to 20 years to establish a connection between Morris Bean's facility and the village's sanitary sewer system so as to alleviate the potential hazard to the village's water supply identified by the village's own wellhead protection plan. I have a short chronology, I've abbreviated it and I will abbreviate it even more. 
but hopefully by doing so it sets up our our present circumstances and avoids the need to do this at um, the formal readings. Um, 1967 is when Morris Bean installed the current sanitation system. Um, it's an aerobic digestion treatment system. It replaced an 18-year-old failing system. In 1992, more than a score ago, the village offered to Morris Bean um, uh, to tie the facility into the village wastewater treatment plant um, to eliminate the perceived hazard the existing MBC system presented to the village water supply and to cover the costs associated with the tie-in. 93 village contracted with an engineering service. 2001 village wellhead protection management plan called for connection of the Morris Bean facility to the village wastewater treatment plant. 2004, village manager Hilliard advised Morris Bean that he would pursue connection of the Morris Bean facility to the village wastewater system. 2005, at village manager Hilliard's recommendation, village council unanimously adopted resolution 2005-14, expressing the council's willingness to provide Morris Bean facility with sewer service by allowing it to connect to the village's system. A um, letter was sent to that effect uh, from the village to Morris Bean in 2005. 2006, the Ohio EPA issued a draft permit. Uh, same year, they issued the aforementioned permit in final form, um, uh, modifying the schedule of compliance to include <coughs> Morris Bean's connection to the village's sewer system as an alternative <coughs> to upgrading Morris Bean's treatment plant based on Morris Bean's representation that a plan existed to tie into the city system, or the village's system. Um, 2010, we jump up, the recommendation of new village manager Cundiff, the village council unanimously approved resolution 2010-01, restating the council's der determination, authorizing the village manager to enter into a sanitary sewer <laughs> connection agreement with Morris Bean. Um, a few days later, the village and Morris Bean signed the original sanitary sewer connection agreement. In October of that same year, the village council unanimously approved ordinance 2010-19 accepting a sewer easement and authorizing the village manager to execute the easement. 2010, later that month, the village published a formal notice of the ordinance accepting the sewer easement. 2011, the Ohio EPA approved a permit to install the Morris Bean lift station in Force, Maine. Um, 2011, um, uh, two months later, the Ohio EPA published an official public notice for availability of draft finding of no significant impact with regard to the lift station. 2011, Morris Bean submitted a renewal application to the Ohio EPA. Um, June of 2011, Morris Bean in reliance on the village's formal commitment to allow and facilitate the connection of the Morris Bean facility to the village's sanitary sewer system, represented to the Ohio EPA that it intended to abandon its sanitary wastewater treatment system and connect to the village's system. Permit included a schedule of compliance for Morris Bean's connection to the village collection system. Ohio EPA issued a final permit 2011 a public notice and draft permit in 2012, and a final permit was issued in 2012, and extensions have been granted since then. So more than a score has passed since we started this process, and, and uh, more speed system continues to age. Something has to be done. We're here today and, and hope to be here the next few uh, uh, readings. Um, to um, avoid losing any more time in getting something accomplished. Morris Bean's choices, you know, are relatively simple. They can install their own system um, and, 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 and at a lesser cost than connecting to the village's system, but they truly do believe that it is in the, the community's interest, that it's in the citizen's interest, that they connect to the village's sanitary sewer system. Uh, we've been working well, at least from our perspective, uh, with village manager Bates and village solicitor Connard um, to tweak that original agreement, um, connection agreement, 
and agree upon one which satisfies the interest of both parties. Um, uh, on Friday, I received a draft from uh, Mr. Connor, and we are, are very close, if not there, at reaching an agreement. Uh, we encourage council to embrace this arrangement as one that is good for the environment, for the community. And beyond <coughs> that, if you have, um, Ms. Bates, can I ask you, does that essentially and accurately describe what's happened? It does, it okay. does, and to the best of my knowledge. I mean, obviously, I wasn't here for quite a bit of that, but um, as far as since my time here, yes. Okay, and if you have any specific questions, um, I encourage you to direct them to Mr. Megro or Mr. Kleinschitz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, were any of, I don't think any of us were on council a decade ago, were we? Judith and I were. were you were. So, so, and I don't know if you were with, were you with Morris? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, in 2000, Mr. Magro, would you mind coming up to the. That's your question. I've been with Morris Bean for 24 years. 24 years. Well, thank you for coming to council. It's good to, to meet you. Thank you um, for listening to us. Of course, us. we know something of the history. I mean, I know something of the history of Morris Bean, and so I think it's important to have a good relationship with the As we do. industry. So I was just wondering what, what happened in 2005 that it didn't happen? Well, we weren't there. We weren't there then. I don't know what <laughs> happened what I, then. We what only we, ju about. we jumped in in 2010, I think, is when it got presented back to us. Oh, again. no, I meant 2005 it said council yeah. was going to do that. Yeah, no, we weren't there at that <clears throat> point. But you were there. I was. Um, <laughs> we had <laughs> a great deal of difficulty getting the village manager to focus on the agreement that needed to be uh, negotiated and executed. And uh, unfortunately, the wheels of government ground very, very slowly. Uh, sort of languished. Oh, language. And then finally, I guess it was 2010, I don't have my chronology that uh, Steve yeah. has, uh, we did finally reach agreement. Uh, excuse me, and part of the problem I might add is early on, um, Dave Hobson had gotten his finger in the pie and arranged for a stag grant, which would have paid <laughs> for a substantial portion of the cost of uh, tying in. Uh, then, because of the delays in reaching getting a document that we could all agree to. Uh, Congress came along and said, if there are any projects where ground has not been broken, they eliminated them. The money comes them. back. And yep. so it, it we lost money on another project. And so. at that point, we looked, the company looked at the situation and said, this is worthwhile doing. If necessary, we'll pick up the entire cost. And, but then we had to go back and the, uh, some of the engineering work had to be redone because up until that time, the village had um, worked with the engineers to develop the plans, and then the company reimbursed the village. Because from the beginning, the village was not to have any cost associated with this. And um, so it went along, and finally we did get an agreement. And then, uh, as with her, I was familiar, very familiar with what happened mm -hmm. thereafter. Um, and the uh, deal fell apart. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ms. Bates and, and we got together last fall. Uh, it was last spring, actually a year ago, okay. because Joe Bates was still here when we started. And worked through a number of the details. It took a while. Uh, she too had her hands full. <laughs> and uh, I believe got a very workable agreement. And, and Patty, from the standpoint of our sewer capacity, from the standpoint of, of infrastructure, this is nothing that would be a burden to no. the village. It's no, well, it, we can handle the load. Um, it's not a problem at all. Brad concurs with that as well. Okay. I mean, certainly, and we we and my recollection of the first time when we when we did initially agree to this is that it was for the reasons of the environmental um, concerns our wellhead um, plan and also Glen Helen. So I think that, you know, I don't know that that's changed. I mean, we still have those, those issues and those concerns um, that resonate for me. Um, I was gonna say, I'd like to see in the legislation that that be highlighted. 
and I, I know do that we have legislation we yet. don't yeah okay. that, I mean when it's written right that yeah. would be part of what council be. determines tonight and and the other thing and Bill since you're here and maybe Larry might need to come up because um, one of the <coughs> concerns that folks still have is the the sinkholes in the discharge channel that is on the back edge of the property mm -hmm. which will not be addressed by this right. uh, agreement and I, I know that you've been working on a solution to that as far as trying to line that the dish I see Larry doing this so. yeah why don't you step up uh, Larry's been handling uh, those issues pretty right. much. and I think that that will be a question that some of the <coughs> citizens probably will have and actually the the sinkhole if you're familiar with it was well maybe six eight inches long a ditch where uh, storm water and our process water leaves our property. The, about a week, two weeks ago, we completed the repair by installing a concrete cloth. What that, if you, you've heard of geomembranes that are used to seal ditches, well this is a geomembrane which is impregnated with concrete that we put about 10 foot wide and probably up to clear to our property line and back about 60 feet onto our property line. <clears throat> and what this does is once, once it's saturated with water, it forms a concrete seal across the top. So it's a, more than just a membrane, it's covered with gravel. It's a solid mass of cement. And as of two weeks ago, last Friday water was flowing past the area and off the property and is EPA taking a look at it if they see yes it? they were out uh, <coughs> excuse me last Friday Ned Sarl who represents us what has visited the site and observed the uh, repair and you you do not have you're not required to have an impedes discharge permit for your for that water, correct? Yes, we do. You do have one. We do have an NPDES permit okay. uh, for the water leaving our property. For the water property. leaving the property. Okay. So, so um, apparently, I, this is the first time this has come to the public, this, the, within this year, anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought it might be good to clarify for the public what water is going, that we're projecting would go into our right. sewer system. That'd be and that it would be uh, primarily just sanitary wastewater and from the some restrooms and some cycle. up to, not to, I think the way it's written in the agreement, not to exceed 600 gallons per day, day of, of Zyglo rinse water. Can you wonder what is Zyglo? It, it's a penetrant rinse water. We, it, to inspect our castings, we, I don't know if you're familiar with fluorescent penetrant inspection, yeah. but the castings are dipped into a material and then rinsed. That material will infiltrate any defect in the casting and will be highlighted underneath a black light so we can see if there's any imperfections in the part that so that it can be repaired or in some cases the casting may need to be rejected. After the casting is dipped, you then you rinse it off, and what this is is the rinse water that carries a little bit of the penetrant dye with that. It is biodegradable, and a sample was provided to, I believe, to Joe Bates right. several years mm -hmm. ago, and he had no problem with that related to your sanitary system. Right, and, and Brad has Brad has researched it as well, and he says it does not require any pretreatment or anything like that. So, so then the water that's going through your own treatment system that's mm -hmm. part of your process, can you say something about... Into the discharge. Oh, that's, in, that's discharged through and now goes through that but past, cement. Past, we were, we can can you say something about that water, what kind of chemicals are in it and what kind of process well, hopefully you use? Well, hopefully no chemicals per se. It's primarily, it's probably half non-contact cooling water going through air compressors oh. and probably half uh, uh, from our plaster process. The, it's called the anion process. It's a plat we make plaster molds for some of our products. And this is the water that's used to rinse the mixers 
that the plaster is mixed in or to rinse the washed plaster out of castings after they've cooled and solidified. And it's also some storm water, correct? And also, of course, storm, all the storm water from the property and neighboring fields also accumulates and goes through this same pathway. So are there contaminants in that wash system, the plaster mm -hmm. wash system? And well, it, it, depends. it depends on what you consider a contaminant. Uh -huh. There's no chemical contaminants that I'm aware of. Uh, it's plaster that we wash out, it goes through two, three settling ponds. It goes through, first it washes into one settling pond, the plaster settles, it overflows to a second pond, the plaster settles, and then it overflows into a very large pond, which supports fish currently, and then it overflows off that large pond to join with the stormwater. And the outfall off the large pond is subject to water samples from the EPA. Mm -hmm. We do collect samples from uh, every Cool. It's sampled once per month. Thank you. I yeah, think that was it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I better understand the process. Oh, I do. Any other questions? And, and you said that's it, that the process with the plaster molds is called the Antioch it's called process the Antioch because process. it was developed. And it was developed by Morris Bean as when he was a co-op student at Antonia College back in the 30s, yeah. 20s and 30s. That's great. So it sounds like if you all are, are um, wanting to add the system, it sounds like things are are going well. Morris Bean is doing well and, and business is... We are there. That's and great. That's good to hear. Yeah. We're happy to hear that. Thank so, you. Thank you. So, Council, I think what... Um, uh, Mr. Magro and, and the rest of the folks are, are wanting to hear is if we're inclined to ask Patty to uh, bring legislation to our June 6th. No, 20th. 20th. Today's June, the 6th. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. Gosh. Over over soon. <laughs> to our June 20th meeting. Um, so it would be it would be an ordinance. It would be two readings. So we'd have our first reading on June 20th and our second reading on July whatever. Um, <laughs> Um, so is are we instructing staff to do that okay so I assume you'll be working with Chris more perhaps but we'll have that legislation and if you gentlemen would like to come back to that meeting it'll be at 7 o'clock on the 20th I mean Thanks. one thing one thing good about the fact that there's two readings is that the public really doesn't know about this I don't think you know so that gives uh, the public an opportunity to know that this is going to be discussed at the next two meetings so, so okay. thanks we'll, uh, we'll thank prepare you. the ordinance thank you all <laughs> um, next we're moving on to the manager's report uh, okay streetscape uh, three is primarily done uh, the contractor will return after street fair to do the area between dragon tree tattoo and peaches and finish that up and Thank you so much to the public works crew and the electric crew for their hard work. The electric crew will begin replacing the light poles at the Bryan Center and installing the long-awaited wow. electric car charging uh, sta stations after street fair. Um, electric Superintendent Johnny Burns will be letting the tree, uh, the bid for tree trimming soon and the affected area will be um, High Street to East Enon and Dayton Street to West South College. It's kind of, I know that sounds weird, and, but if you look on the map, you'll be able to figure out exactly where that is. Um, we will be starting work on the new barn out at Sutton Farm within the next couple of weeks to, to get the uh, foundation in and get that up finally that we've been working on for a couple of years. Uh, Part-time meter reader Brian Upchurch has been promoted to full-time to fill the position left uh, by Dan Robertson's uh, departure. And Dustin Harris has been hired to fill a part-time regular temporary position. And I know that sounds weird, but once we get all of the, um, the remote read meters in, we may not need a permanent part-time person. So that's why it is currently a temporary position. Our contract with uh, Maveca to provide internet services expires June 30th, and I will be signing a new three-year term with Maveca. It's uh, all the same, exactly the same, except they actually dropped the price just a little bit. Um, so we will uh, just extend that. Uh, we did receive uh, notice that we did not get the community development block grant for the sidewalk ramps, um, and uh, this year the, uh, the awards went to uh, the villages of Clifton and Jamestown. 
So and what does that mean? Um, that means that we will not be putting in any additional um, handicap ramps this year, except for the ones that we um, told the Mills Lawn students that we were going to do, um, and the ones that we're putting in as part of the streetscape. Um, if we get to the end of the year and we have some money left over, we could conceivably take a little bit of money out of the streets and, and let a contract to put in some more. But we will reapply again next year, uh, or if another grant comes up, for more uh, handicap ramps. So that's community development block grant is a good avenue for those. Uh, we did just receive a fully executed uh, contract of our copy uh, copy of our contract to purchase part of the Brand County landfill gas project. So that will take effect in March of 2017 and continue through February of 2032. And we do we will be retaining our recs from that. So we will still have our renewable recs. And Judy, can you put the picture? <coughs> oh, yeah. Thanks for the um, reminder. Yeah. Um, if you looked at the Facebook page, you noticed that Johnny Burns and I went to the Meldahl Dam Hydroelectric Project dedication. And, and you went swimming. And we went swimming. With yes. Maui. Okay. <laughs> so here's the interesting part. If you look at that picture, we're about a quarter of a mile from that structure. And what you're looking at, there are 10 stories below water level. Wow. So the, it, it's a, it was a really interesting tour. Um, but yeah, once you start going down, it's 10 stories wow. down below the water level. It's got a 23 plus foot head on it. So um, hmm. it, that's the, the fall between where it goes in and where it comes out to produce the electricity. Um, but um, this is a what river? Um, it's on the Ohio in yeah. Foster, Kentucky. And um, it's, it was very nice. As part of the project, they were required by the Army Corps to create a fishing, a fishing park, which is actually on the other side of the structure there. And uh, it is very heavily used by the residents. They love it. And um, the, it, it was, I mean, we were actually walking. There's a huge concrete area uh, in the middle there, and we were actually walking on that. And then we went down inside and saw the turbines. Uh, the turbine blades are 32 feet across. Um, they're huge, and there are three turbines. So, very interesting. Uh, Patty, back to sidewalk ramps. How mm -hmm. many do we have left to do? Oh, heck. A um, lot? 20 something? Um, yeah, I think it, it's just below 30 because the way, the way that this started was um, Denise and I had worked on a um, MVRPC mm -hmm. grant mm -hmm. that we did not get, and it was for all of the remaining um, sidewalk ramps. Right. And so this community development block grant, we, um, we reduced the scope of the whole project to go for this because we thought we'd have a better chance if, if we asked for less money from the county. Right. Um, so we were just asking for the ones up uh, Xenia Avenue on the west side that are still unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones that we asked for in the um, MVRPC grant were up Xenia Avenue and then they were up West South College. And I think that there were a few, um, there were a few others um, that were in there too, but the majority of them were Xenia Avenue and West South College. And there were like 25 or 20. Yeah, it's, it's just below 30. Okay. And um, IT services? Oh, uh, actually, um, I, I created a committee <coughs> that consisted of myself, Melissa, uh, Thor Sage and um, uh, Ken Metz from the police department because he had a lot of their IT stuff. And we unanimously agreed that tech advisors uh, would be the, the choice for the village. So I will be bringing a resolution to council um, at the next meeting. Uh, we just, last Friday was when we met and, and had, um, we talked to two of, the, two of the five firms that submitted proposals. And it, it was unanimous that it be tech advisors. Okay. And um, they will start? They will start. They actually want to start a week early. They want to start assign, as soon as the contract is signed. Um, July 1 is the official date that we were looking to get them started. Um, but they actually have a person who lives on Swimming Pool Road who is going to be our contact um, available 24-7. Uh, uh, Bartley Davis is his name. Um, he's fairly active in our community. Um, and so uh, they are very much looking forward to to becoming our IT uh, provider. Very good. Cool. Um, and any reports on um, the schedule for 
repaving 68. I saw in the Dayton Daily News that they're starting on the bridges, starting down as far south as, as the project goes, and that those bridges are probably going to take quite a few weeks. Yeah, I, I, we haven't heard any even approximate dates, but I wouldn't expect it until late August. And oh, really? the additional repair work that um, we're talking about on sidewalks, um, some of the kind of emergency repairs. Right, Mark is going to be working on that. I think this week he's trying to stay away from the downtown area, although he was going to try to get that really bad heat section there by the, uh, the Winds Wine Store. He was going to try to get that done before street fair. And he's working on some of the other areas um, in the village that Jason had directed him to work on. And then he's going to come back and do and he's going to do those two ramps over okay. there by Mills Lawn. And he's going to come back after Street Fair and do the, the okay. part between Dragon Tree and Peaches. Okay, great. Any other comments or questions for Patty? Good job. Uh, Melissa, your, your report is already done. Covered. Yeah. Um, Judy? Um, mostly I was just giving everyone a heads up that the Planning Commission meeting is going to be kind of massive. It, lots and lots of items on the agenda for that one and will probably result in more legislation for you folks. Um, and on the bummer end of the scale, uh, OMCA decided not to come to this area for the 2017 training, so they're going to be in Cleveland. So, oh. Yeah. Um, that's too bad. Um, okay, so future agenda items. Again, June 8th, um, that is a special council work session. Um, we will be in A and B, and is it, ab it is about uh, municipal fiber, and the folks from SpringsNet will be presenting and answering a lot of questions. Um, can I just say something about that? Um, so there is a separate short packet for the June 8th meeting with uh, an FAQ uh, that is designed to answer a lot of the questions we already had. And uh, I think it would also be a good idea to review the white paper again so that we're prepared on Wednesday. So. Would and you like that made available, Brian? Yeah, that'd be I great. I like a hard copy. Okay. Uh, we also have, um, on June 20th, we have, um, we're, we have the uh, solar um, agreement with uh, AEP mm -hmm. as a resolution. We have the second reading and public hearing of um, the two the two planning ordinances we heard and we will also add I don't know what the number will be but we'll add the ordinance related to um, Morris Bean sewer yep and then you've got the resolution authorizing the tech advisors mm -hmm. okay. for IT services okay and then on July 5th tax budget funding of commissions a few other um, discussion of regarding distribution of proceeds from sale of village land and village funding of special events so that will be um, potentially a big meeting we don't know if we have any legis well we will have we will have the second reading of the Morris Bean ordinance of, ordinance at that point so um, motion to adjourn so moved. second all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.